Who are the top five prospects in the 2023 NBA draft as of now and what makes them so special? Coming up on Locked On NBA Big Board. You are Locked On NBA Big Board, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up? My name is Richard Stamen. Welcome back to another episode of Locked On NBA Big Board. I am a media credentialed. uh, I'm a member of, I guess, the media and college basketball uh, across multiple campuses. TCU uh, is my main one. That's my main stomping grounds as of now out of Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, I'm filling in again for Rafael Barlow will be me, Leif Tuline, Sam, um, Sam Ferris. Us three will be filling in for Rafael one more week before he returns he just had a uh, newborn child so congratulations to him uh, obviously this is about the perfect time to have a child this is the dead period of college, of basketball really uh, one of the most dead periods in sports so it's a good time uh, but first i want to thank everybody before we get into the top picks and everything and the top prospects in the 2023 nba draft i want to thank everybody for continuing to listen and making this your first listen of the day of locked on nba big board uh, it really means a lot. I know, again, it's the dog days of the summer, of the off season. So really appreciate it. It means a lot to me. It means a lot to Sam, Raphael, and Leaf. Uh, but before we get into anything, this episode is brought to you by Bet Bet BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. So I want to talk about some of the top picks in this draft. I think it's an absolutely stacked class. I'll give some context of what the boards generally look like right now. I'm going to read 247's consensus board, uh, recruiting, I should say, rankings, uh, which what that is is that essentially they have a composite where they can bind all the rankings and then weigh them, and then they make it out to a consensus board. So the top 10 that they have is Derek Lively from Duke, Dariq Whitehead, uh, who's also going to Duke, Nick Smith, who's going to Arkansas, Kyle Filipowski, also Duke, as you can tell, there's no drop-off even with Coach K retiring. Dylan Mitchell, who's going to Texas, um, who's a freak athlete. I'm not going to talk about him because he's not in mine. But freak athlete at 6'7". Keontae George from Baylor. Amari Bailey from UCLA. He's a guard. Kaysen Wallace, younger brother if you're a college basketball diehard, of Keaton Wallace from UTSA, one of the better uh, Conference USA NBA prospects in recent years. He's going to Kentucky. Kalel Ware, who's going to Oregon, and then Jerace Walker from Houston. And actually, just because this class is so good, just to give an idea of some other guys, because you will hear one other player in this next five. I'll read the top 15. So it goes Chris Livingston at Kentucky, Julian Phillips at Tennessee, Cam Whitmore at Villanova, Brandon Miller at Alabama, and Adam Bona from UCLA. So it's a really stacked class. Arkansas also has two more guys in the top 20. It, it's a ridiculously fun class, and Duke still has more top 25 guys. I'm a big fan. I think this is going to be one of the more fun drafts that we've ever seen. It's going to rival 2021. It's going to rival 2018. The preseason hype is there. And who knows what will emerge from the bottom half of the top 100. It happens every year. Uh, Somebody who's going to make a run for this top five, Terquavion Smith, is probably hiding in plain sight. He was the 94th ranked prospect last year on ESPN or 98, something like that. He was really not a consensus top guy. People didn't think of him as an NBA guy. There will be somebody like that. So that'll throw off all of these rankings too. I imagine somebody returning will be in the top 10, probably Terquavion Smith. Uh, There's a lot of good returning talent. So overall, not only does this draft have more picks, only one more because he had another draft pick forfeited, which I don't like at all uh, from an NBA fan's perspective. You know, it doesn't matter about what team side you are on. It's really unfair to kids to take away a pick because you hear the stories of like Christian Wood and why, you know, that hearing their name called matters so much. And I think it's really unfair to some of those guys to, to take a pick away from the draft process and they don't even get compensated. It's like, all right, go home. See you later. So I really don't like that. But ultimately let's get into the top five. I have, I will start with the first two. I'm going to dive into my number three because I'm really big on him. And then my four and five, I'm going to kind of close out on. So Starting at number one, Victor Wembanyama has to be the answer. He is unknown height at this point, uh, but probably seven four, seven three. It's a, that's generally the range we hear. Could be even seven five. What makes him so special is his ability to score, potentially all three levels, can play make, and can defend. 
And when you have a center who does that, it is absolutely franchise changing. It is a one of one player. You look at big playmakers, generally the ones who are big playmakers and play defense and can also shoot when needed. That's a superstar. Uh, I did this. Pro- I did this process with Chet Holmgren, somebody who gets two blocks a game, two assists a game. Don't even factor anything else. It eliminates almost everybody that has ever played at seven foot or taller. And there's only like 40 player, 40 seasons, I should say, and like only really 20 players or 15 players on this list. And the worst two players were like Andrew Bogut and Vladi Divac. And Vladi Divac was an all-star, if I'm not mistaken. So that's a really good company. When you can be a playmaker, obviously the stats don't pop out uh, because he only played 18 minutes a game, but 9.4 rebounds per game, 5.1 rebounds, or excuse me, 9.4 points per game, five rebounds a game, one assist, one steal, two blocks, and that's all in 18 minutes per game, uh, 26% from three on three attempts a game. You'd like to see that number go up, but he shoots 70% from the line, pretty consistent with year over year. So the shooting upside is very real. And what makes him so special though, beyond just being tall and having these abilities is just how great he is at some of this stuff at such a young age. He missed the draft for 2021 or excuse me, 2022 this last season by four days. The rule is you have to turn 18 the year before the calendar year before your draft. So he turned 18 on January 4th this year. If he had been born December 31st, he would have been eligible. Kind of like Alexei Pokachevsky, I think was at that December 31st deadline for 2020. Kind of the same thing. So I really like Wembenyama. You look at his defense, he can block just about any shot. He's so long. Uh, almost, I mean, you look at just a perfect build. Like if you've ever played 2K and you just go on there and make somebody the max wingspan, max height, and give them all the ball skills, it, it's literally what the potential uh, Victor Wembenyama has. Like he, he's an absolute cheat code of a build. So that's what the appeal is. Um, I know there's been a ton of breakdowns on him. My guy, Motor City Hoops, actually just posted something on my site, mapsdraft.com. Uh, a little shameless plug there. If you want to see a deeper dive, I mean, I've posted tons of videos. He makes no look passes look easy. He does incredible shot blocking. I like, I like everything he brings really. Uh, and I just don't see a way he fails outside of injuries. That's really his biggest weakness is can he stay healthy? Because he has fought a good amount of injuries. Uh, somebody on Reddit put out there a post basically highlighting every year he's missed time. Uh, extensive time it's not like you know you hear players such as anthony davis who they're missing one game every you know one of every four like they'll play three one off three one off but that's come the norm so it's not a big deal but like when you get these big breaks in game like the bones are sensitive he's growing this is growing too fast who knows that's really the only thing that can get in his way the skill is not going to be the reason he fails in basketball and in the nba so really high upside for him Really excited to see what he can bring to the table. And ultimately, I just I think he's going to be the number one pick in the NBA draft next year. You look at how big men generally have to be uh, these modern – I mean, the modern player is a player who can defend and shoot and not be a liability on the perimeter. Not only is Victor Wembanyama not a liability and he does those things – well, he does those things all at a high level. So I look at that. It's really promising. And then you throw in the playmaking, which I fully buy – as he develops his body, he's going to be a star. Like skill wise, again, same thing with Chet Holmgren. Chet Holmgren's not going to fail because of skill. He's not a bad player at all. Like he is super skilled and it translates up. He's, he would only fail because his body can't hold up in the NBA for an 82 game season and throughout physicality and handle just the physical elements of the game. That would be the big reason he fails. I said I was going to touch on um, my number two player in this portion, but I, I'm going to get to him. And my number three, I'm going to do a deeper dive on both in a second. But first, let me tell you about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your sports and uh, favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. You can find reviews, news, every game, including MLB. And once the NBA returns and college basketball returns, you'll be able to find it on there as well. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have you covered. They've been doing a great job with uh, the MLB betting. I've, I've utilized it myself. I think it's a fun, uh, I think it's been a great MLB season as a baseball fan. So a little side tangent there, but you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, baseball. I've been utilizing that, been really helpful for me personally. Uh, but head, on, head to Bet Online today or use your phone to learn more about the action happening today. Bet Online where the game 
starts. So I want to talk about my number two and three players here real quick. So my number two player is Scoot Henderson. I think he's probably the only player that could sniff Victor Wembanyama's excuse me, Victor Wembanyama, uh, his star territory. And I know that's a hard name to pronounce. So I know uh, I'm happy to be off of that segment for now to Scoot Henderson, who he was revolutionary. He went to the G League Ignite a year early. A lot of times you hear it, players go, they graduate high school, they go to the G League. Jaden Hardy did that. Jonathan Kaminga did that. Jalen Green, pretty much anyone who's done that so far has been that way. Scoot Henderson was the first though, where he said, I'm actually going to go as a junior in high school, play my senior year, and then play my first year out of what would be my senior year in the G League again. So he signed a two-year deal with them and then will be eligible for the draft. And just Scoot Anderson did not disappoint. Um, he was really, really impressive. The stats for him are a little bit off because online, the way the stats work generally don't uh, add up to the official stuff I've been told, but I don't have the official for him, only the players from his last draft. He averaged 14.3 points per game, four assists a game, over four and a half rebounds a game, 1.6 steals. And that was on 45% shooting. The three-point percentage was very low at 22%, but he shot 78% from the line. So that is kind of what I trust more. The form checks out. The selling point with Scoot Henderson is he's a really good athlete, advanced in the pick and roll, which is probably the number one skill you need as a guard offensively. And he can score at all three levels. So you look at a complete offensive player at point guard, I, I really think it's really hard to overthink him. I just don't see a way he fails. Yeah, that three-point percentage is low, but he was a senior in high school playing probably three, four levels above where most seniors uh, are ready for. Uh, not normally are, but just simply ready for. So he was playing at an advanced rate. He de- had to develop and learn quickly. Had a lot of strong showings, just super skilled all around. And, I, and with that, you just kind of look for the flashes. You say, hey, where where is he improving? Where is he uh, showing any, you know, um, just general indications that this is a real flash. And it was every single game you found something deep, that uh, deeply advanced pick and roll plays that most guys in the G League aren't even making. Great athlete, uh, can shoot, can pull up on mid range, things like that. Like, I love everything about his game. The form is projectable. I fully buy it. And then there's probably defensive upside. I think the G League's really hard to tell for that. So, not necessarily the best place for that. But my number three player, uh, so, so top two, I got Victor Wembanyama, Scoot Henderson. They're close-ish enough where I can justify them being uh, in the same tier potentially. But right now I have them each on their own island of a tier. Then it gets a little bit different. I'd probably put this player at safely number three. Nobody really comes close, so maybe another island tier. But that is, uh, that is Derek Lively. He is I, – I don't know how big he truly is. He's measured at 7'1", 220. So we've already seen a 7-1 guy who uh, has some length and needs to add weight. Lively, of course, needs to add weight because 220 is still a little bit less than desired, but it's not that bad. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Chet was, what, 190, 200, somewhere in that range. So has a good amount of uh, extra weight on him. He can hold his own on the perimeter. Uh, there's some plays. I, I went back and watched. The, the reason I really wanted to even do this whole episode was simply because I watched a game of him versus Seth Tremble, who was on one of the FIBA teams. I think it was the U18s. And he just, there was a possession from last year's EYBL Peach Jam where he just absolutely locked up Tremble on one possession. He got two blocks. Like Tremble tries to get an ISO off of a handoff on him, goes, switches directions, goes to the rim, tries finishing around him, and Lively just swats it, no problem, sideways. And then the next guy, the off, I guess on the, on the side of uh, the paint, I'm struggling with words here, but. He comes back, he gets this, this other guy gets the offensive rebound, tries a pump fake, puts it up, thinks Lively will for sure jump, doesn't jump, and does the exact same thing and swats him again. So he's impressive. Not rare to see him get multiple blocks in a game, uh, really even like four blocks in a game. It's pretty commonplace for him. I think he'll be one of the best shot blockers in college basketball this year. And then you look at offense, like uh, just to round out the defense, he's complete on the defense event. He's going to be able to hold his own on the perimeter. Uh, just block shots. I don't think he's going to struggle with fouls that much, uh, especially because Chet Holmgren didn't really. I don't see why Derek Lively would. And also he's got a similar surrounding cast around him where he's going to have help where he doesn't need to do everything, which is big. That's big for big men. And I think that's what gets a lot of these guys exposed, quote unquote, uh, and makes them just, you know, look a lot worse than they actually are. Lively won't have that curve around him, uh, 
that he won't have to worry about. So I like that a lot. Then you get to the offense. I think he's got some playmaking ability. Uh, very, very lightly. I'm not going to say it's like a big strength, but you know, he can make reads. Like he can keep the ball moving. It's what you need from the center. If he can make reads on the top of the key, it's a very common dribble handoff, fake dribble handoff spot. Um, you look at guys like DeAndre Jordan, things like that. You have to be able to find the cutters off the fake handoffs, and that's a that's a skill for big men. Outside of that, the passing doesn't really pop that much, but the real areas that are really impressive to me are the finishing because he's so long. Again, 7-1 with a long wingspan. It takes nothing for him to rise up. It wouldn't shock me if he has the same standing reach as Mark Williams, who had 9-9 standing reach so he only needs three inches off the ground to dunk in theory um maybe four to get above but he'll very much clear that because he's an nba player so i i really like that i think he's going to be an elite finisher i think he's going to be really good as a shooter I, I like the form it needs work but you look at the touch and the follow through and and it's there so i i think that's a real skill for him and ultimately i uh i think he's going to be able to be a stretch the floor, defend the rim, finish at the rim, all three of those high levels. So ultimately I buy into Derek Lively. Uh, I wasn't as into him last year, but I think knowing that he played with Jalen Duren, so he was in a weird situation. Those are similar players and they shared the court at times. And like they even ran pick and rolls where Duren was the, the ball handler and Lively was the role man. It was just kind of clunky. So I think it was harder. I didn't give the context a fair shot. I think Derek Lively is somebody who is, Probably going to be the best big not named Victor Wembanyama. Obviously, it's not much of a hot take. He's the consensus number one player out of high school this year. So, you know, maybe need to brush up on my hot takes or something. But, I mean, sometimes the easiest takes are the ones right in front of you. They're, not, they're correct. So, I think Lively is going to be a top five player. I would absolutely buy into him. Let's finish out the top five after this. So far, we've got Scoot Henderson. Uh, excuse me, Victor Wembanyama, then Scoot Henderson. And then Derek Lively is the top three. Let's finish out the top five after a word from our sponsors. Welcome back to Locked on NBA Big Board again. I am Richard Stamen filling in for the great Raphael Barlow. So <clears throat> I want to just finish out this, uh, this show just talking about the top five. So far, we've had Victor Wembanyama at number one, Scoot Henderson at number two, Derek Lively at number three. Let's finish out the top five. So recently over the weekend, we had... A big decommitment, well, the decommitment, I guess, came actually a couple weeks ago, but a reclassification and commitment from G.G. Jackson out of South Carolina and going to the University of South Carolina. He recently, uh, I had said it last week as if it was fact, it was pretty rumored, it wasn't something I, I like, you know, found myself, but he committed to South Carolina. He's a 6'9 forward, uh, really athletic, has a good mid-range game, should be able to defend long 6'9", 210, has the body, uh, so he's really strong. He'll reclassify into this year's draft, be eligible from day one to play at South Carolina on opening night this year in November. He's really gifted. Uh, there's not as much tape on him at a, for as long as a lot of these guys because of that reclassification, but he did just play all of Peach Jam, which is really big. Stood out there, and you look at just the physical tools, and it's really strong. Uh, I, I have a hard time not buying into him, his skill translating well. The area that's going to hurt him is what does the team context do for him? Because South Carolina, not the best team. Uh, they weren't, they, I don't know, the last time they made the NCAA tournament, I think it was uh, 2019, but they have some, some good players around there. Uh, and also at the little bit, I can't remember their roster uh, entirely. They were 18 and 13 last year, had some guys transfer out. Um, but I really ultimately, don't know what this looks like. Is this another Markel Fultz, Ben Simmons kind of thing where these great talents, these transcendent talents are on these bad teams? Or is this something he goes to an actually okay team already and then gets them in the NCAA tournament? Because that would be big for his stock. I think people put a lot of stock in winning and just how they impact winning now, um, especially since, I mean, whether it's fair criticism or not, Markel Fultz and Ben Simmons, I don't think they, I think a lot of those concerns were, well, more for Simmons. The Fultz stuff, I think, was freakish. But, you know, they were on bad teams and they didn't help their teams win. Biggest criticism of Ben Simmons right now is what does he do, you know, in terms of is he a franchise-building player? And when you're on those bad teams, you're always going to have, as a top pick, you're always going to have that target on their back. But the tools, I think, are worth investing in for G.G. Jackson. 
Who knows at this point what that answer is. If, is he a winning player? Does he help teams win? Probably. I mean, talent helps win is my guess. So I would err on the side of safety on that and say, yes, uh, he is going to be a winning player when you're a top talent. Who knows? We'll see what he does at South Carolina, though. Really excited for that. The SEC is absolutely stacked. And then my number five player, Cam Whitmore. He was somebody who he's the only one not in the top 10 uh, that is eligible, I should say, from this big board I read. He was number 13 consensus. He showed out of the FIBA U18s. Uh, he just showed out to be an all-around wing. And I think when you are an all-around wing at his size, which uh, he measured last at 6'6", 200, but I'm pretty sure he's above 6'7", uh, just from seeing him next to his peers that are similarly sized. Pretty sure he's about 6'7". 6'7 is a pretty standard type, uh, or excuse me, height on the wing. When you're the prototype wing, they pan out. Like They can defend, they can shoot, and they can pass. It's everything you want from the wing. What's his ceiling? Hard to say, but I know he's going to pan out. I did the exact same thing this last year with Ben Matherin. I think he's going to be somebody who sticks just because there is such a high floor given his skills at his position. Ultimately, that's why I have Cam Whitmore there. Same thing. Really fun defender. Great athlete. Honestly, kind of similar, but I think more skilled with the ball than Ben Matherin. Uh, so I, I like him a lot. If I liked Benedict Matherin, I'm obviously going to like him. Whitmore, not one-to-one -one at all, but you look at just the talent on the wings, I think he's going to be the guy. If you want a bonus player here, um, I think – uh, actually, I didn't even, wow, you know, I went through all this without even mentioning Derek Whitehead. I don't know how he's not on my top five, but as of now, uh, so be it. I'll probably change that at some point. But Derek Whitehead is somebody who is really gifted. I think he's going to be a three-level scorer, needs to improve his finishing, can be a good defender, really just modern kind of guard. Uh, how he runs the pick and roll at the next level will probably be the next step. Uh He's considered a, a wing at some points, but I think he can play some guard, can be a primary initiator. Not really sure what his position is, but he's somebody right in that mix too. This draft is absolutely stacked. The fact that I didn't even have him in my top five at this moment, which I kind of disagree with myself after listing all of it out, it says a lot about this draft. I think he should very much be in the mix. And I think ultimately from one and two are pretty inner, like they're locked. I think at this point, Victor Wembanyama is the number one player. Scoot Henderson is number two. From there, I think you can make an, any argument for so many guys, even guys that didn't list, at being number three, including Derek Whitehead. Uh, I think he very well might be there. I think Lively's in the mix. There's a lot of guys there. I mean, even Terquavion Smith every year again, there's a sophomore in the top ten just about. So he's probably going to be up there. Maybe it's somebody we're not expecting at all. Uh, but I love this draft class, and I think it's fun to dive this – far deep right now because not only is the recruiting like the high school tape really strong already it just kind of gets your hopes up for the college season and I don't think it's going to disappoint at all I thought this last year was really fun despite an underwhelming recruiting class and you know I think ultimately this next year is going to be really fun as well so uh, that was my top five it ended with Victor Wembanyama actually we'll go top six Victor Wembanyama Scoot Henderson Derek Lively uh, and then Cam Whitmore, uh, or excuse me, GG Jackson, Cam Whitmore, and then Dariq Whitehead. I lost my order there for a second. I, I'm so thrown off by not having Whitehead in there uh, that it just kind of threw me through a loop. But thank you so much for listening and watching. And again, if you aren't on YouTube, please give us a, you know, just like, subscribe, all the fun stuff that you hear for the last 10 years about YouTube channels. Go ahead and do that for us. It would mean a lot, please. Uh, we are at NBA Big Board. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.